Thank you so much for joining us again. Well, my name is Simon Godwin, and I'm the Artistic Director of the Shakespeare Theatre Company here in Washington, D.C. And tonight's episode is about identity and ambiguity, which we're going to be talking about in relation to As You Like It and Twelfth Night. This episode of the Shakespeare Hour has very generously been supported by Mrs. Eden Rafshoon, who's been a long supporter of the theatre and I count a dear friend. Thank you so much, Eden. The Shakespeare Hour is produced as part of our online initiative called Shakespeare Everywhere, which is supported and generously sponsored by the Beach Street Foundation. So a big thanks to them as well. Well, now let me introduce our wonderful guests for this evening. Tonight we are joined by acclaimed actress Francesca Paradani, who STC audiences will remember from Michael Kahn's Strange Interlude and as Rosalind in the 2009 production of As You Like It. Francesca, are you there? I am. Hi. So nice to be here, Simon. Nice to see Well, welcome. How are you? I'm all right. I'm, I'm, I'm actually very well. I'm up here in uh, upstate New York and I'm outside and I feel very, um, feels very ardent, like I have to say. Ah, An escape, a place to escape and renew yourself, I would say. That's terrific. And you've got some lovely flowers there with you. Ooh, I thought, you know, brought the bus cups in, thought it was appropriate. Wonderful. Okay, great. Well, welcome. Can I call you Frankie? You can indeed. Please do. Okay, well, brilliant. Uh, next up is Michael Urey, Drama Desk Awards winning actor and last seen at Shakespeare Theatre Company as Hamlet. Michael, are you there? I am. Hi, how are you? Thank you oh. so much for having me. Oh, thanks for coming. Uh, it's great to see you. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, where are you, Michael? I'm in Manhattan, um, in the middle of it all. Uh, uh, but I have a, a lovely apartment and I have a lot of windows and a dog and a cat and a partner. And I'm very, I'm very comfortable. Um, you know, it's just, it's navigating the people. Um, but you know, New Yorkers are cool. Everyone's doing a pretty good job. I would say 90% of, 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 of New Yorkers are, are handling it well. Okay, that's great. Are you feeling consoled by Shakespeare? Yes, I've actually had the most wonderful day curled up reading, reading As You Like It in Twelfth Night again. So thank you. It's been, oh. it's been very nice. That's terrific. And I would now like to turn to our third guest tonight, which is the distinguished scholar, Dr. Michael Whitmore, who is, of course, the director of the Folger Shakespeare Library. Hello, Michael. Hello, Simon. It's great to see you. Great to see you. Where are you, Michael, tonight? So I'm in the basement of my house on Capitol Hill, uh, where people seem to be walking around and uh, enjoying themselves and uh, wishing that I could be back in the library with all those books. But I, I have a piano down here, and I do have a couple of books, so I'm doing just fine. Oh, good. I, I hope those, the, the couple of books that you have are As You Like It in Twelfth Night. <laughs> I do, and I'm looking at them online, so I will be totally prepared for whatever you have to say. I love that. Well, that's a great gauntlet. Thank you very much, Michael. And of course, uh, last but very much not least, uh, my co-host, Drew Lichtenberg. Drew, are you there? Yes, hello, I am here. How are you this evening? I am well, and I wanted to ask you, Simon, as is our tradition here at the Shakespeare Hour, what Shakespeare character are you feeling like tonight? Ah, well, thank you, Drew. Um, well, as, as the folks, uh, viewers know by now, um, I spend my Shakespeare hours in the uh, Rectortown uh, Methodist Church Hall, um, because the, where the internet is great, because I'm living uh, in uh, rural Virginia, about an hour from DC. So the character that I am this evening, I feel like Duke Senior, uh, leading his band of merry men and women, a wife and twin daughters, in the great journey of uh, hope, and uh, joy in the, uh, in the Forest of Art. So I'm Duke Senior tonight. Thank you, Drew. And Frankie, what Shakespeare character are you feeling like tonight? You know, the last few days or even weeks, I have to say I'm feeling a bit first fairy. Oh, that's interesting. Lots, because yeah, you know, lots guess. of very, very minute, important things to do all the time that I'm rushing around doing, and the humans around me don't really seem to notice. You know, it's, I think it's, it's something about being a mother. But it makes me think of her. I love her so much, the way she flits around with a lot to do. And, and it's very important and very detailed. 
First Star is certainly one of the key underrated characters in the canon. Uh, Michael Whitmore, what, what Shakespeare character are you feeling like tonight on Capitol Hill? Well, I, I hope it's not Jaquees because he's, he's really a melancholic, but I, I think I feel more like Sebastian from Twelfth Night. You just, you get thrown up on the shores of some place, it's new, and you just wonder what's gonna happen. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm ready for just about anything. Ooh, exciting. Michael Yuri. Well, I, uh, I'm spending uh, most of my time these days producing a, an online theater festival called Pride Plays, uh, which used to be in a real theater. Now it's uh, online. And so I have my, uh, I, I'm, we're producing 11 uh, online workshops and four uh, readings for Playbill.com. So I'm, I'm running from, from Zoom to Zoom these days. Um, and, and I have all these different people who need me. And so I feel like Dromeo, but I don't, I don't really know which, which one. <laughs> it's got to be Dromeo from Syracuse. He's probably oh. the better Dromeo. <laughs> <laughs> or it's one of those productions where I play both. Just, just a thought. Ah, oh, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we get started, I just wanted to refresh everybody watching at home on how this webinar works. You should have at the bottom of your screen a Q&A button as well as a chat button. If you want to share with everyone else what Shakespeare character you're feeling like tonight, please use the chat button. And if you want to ask me or any of our wonderful panelists questions throughout the night or throughout the hour, please use the Q&A button and we will be answering those questions throughout the show. Which brings me to our subject tonight. Uh, the subject is ambiguity and identity and the plays we're discussing are As You Like It and Twelfth Night. For those of you who haven't been at home uh, reading the plays, a quick refresher, these are both referred to by scholars as the high comedies. We believe they were written between 1599 and 1601, uh, so sort of the era when the globe is opening up. Uh, these are both plays that start very seriously with Duke Senior and Rosalind and As You Like It being exiled to the Forest of Arden. And in Twelfth Night, of course, uh, a shipwreck leaving Viola with, separated from her twin brother, Sebastian, on the shores of Illyria. Uh, these plays are both fish out of water plays. They revolve around strong female characters who find themselves in a topsy-turvy world. Uh, these plays are both romantic comedies. Viola falls in love with Orsino and is caught up in a love triangle with the Countess Olivia. Rosalind falls in love with Orlando, decides to woo him is caught up in the love triangle with the shepherdess Phoebe. And last but not least, these are both plays of disguise. Rosalind and Viola both go in disguise as boys, as page boys, uh, in order to pass in this strange world. Um, and the action gets more complex and convoluted from there. But that's a quick refresher on As You Like It in Twelfth Night, which brings me to our question, how does Shakespeare explore gender identity and sexuality in these two plays? Michael Whitmore, we're going to start tonight with you. Uh, thank you, Drew. Well, that's, that's a big question. Uh, I'll just try to kick us off. I tend to go to see these plays and try to understand them more as kind of wisdom literature. They, they're there to tell us things that we can't tell ourselves or won't hear. And when it comes to courtship and desire and sexuality, something that just, it always strikes me about Shakespeare's plays, there are two things. First is they show people who are really their own worst enemy when it comes to acting on their desires. You find characters who are attracted to someone and then they do almost everything in their power to push that person away. And there's something fundamentally perverse about that, the way in which people get in their own way and so these plays use two female characters who are almost, they're almost like love teachers, but they have to help these men figure out how to recognize them. And what a struggle, you know, why is it so hard for a character who loves someone else to look at them and say, here you are before me, the person I want. And when Rosalind is in disguise and uh, Orlando is looking at the person he loves and can't see her, it's, it's kind of amazing, but I think it's also, it's like, it's an illustration of something that 
lots of people do. And comedy sometimes has to outsmart people so that they actually fall in love. And, and I think that's, first I think it's true and I think it's a very perceptive thing for Shakespeare to talk about. And the second thing that I think about with these two plays is just how odd it is. Uh, at certain points, characters become interchangeable. So the character who I kind of feel like tonight, Sebastian, he's there in the play and he's kind of waiting around until he's needed because then he'll provide um, the lover for Olivia. And you, you just kind of wonder, why is it that she'll say at that point when she realizes that she's mistaken Viola, why will she say, oh, well, oh, there you are, you'll do, you're, you're great. Um, it seems kind of counterintuitive that she would just say, oh, oh, it's a totally different person, but you're great, I'll marry you, right on the spot. But on the other hand, I think about how people are drawn and attracted to other people, and sometimes they don't really see the person, they kind of see them out of their peripheral vision, and, and they have a type, or they have a certain kind of posture, or something that they really are attracted to. And so I, I do think people kind of make up their minds before they really see the person they love. And if they're really lucky, uh, they actually learn to know the person that they love and can be with them. But the fact that we mistake, uh, we mistake the people that we eventually fall in love with seems so basic to Shakespeare's comedies. It's certainly a theme that pops up again and again that first love or the blush of first love is very different from a sustained romantic adult relationship. Uh, previously we saw in Midsummer Night's Dream and Romeo and Juliet, the kind of terrifying interchangeability of love uh, in these early plays and in these younger characters. And it seems like in these two plays, he's going deeper somehow. Uh, and of course, to pile on top of all the complications, in Shakespeare's time, you have young boys playing the female roles. So in As You Like It, you have a boy actor playing the character, the female character, Rosalind, who's playing the young boy, Ganymede, who's having Orlando woo her as Rosalind. A play about a boy playing a girl, playing a girl, playing a boy, playing a girl. And similarly in Twelfth Night. Uh, and that's a question also that we have from Beth Bernhardt. Is it hard to play a boy playing a woman playing a boy? Is that different from just playing a regular character? And maybe we'll get to that after we hear uh, from you, Francesca. Yes, hi. Um, well, I have to say, uh, I started with the issue of just identity for a second before I got to the gender identity. Because when I read As You Like It this time around, I was so struck by the love story of it in a way that I, I feel like I just over a sort of powerful love story and about what it means to deeply, deeply fall in love, like you were saying, Drew, and the transformative nature of that act and Arden being a place where you can go and such transformation can take place and your true nature can come out. And even the, the people who are the, perhaps the furthest from their innate good, goodness, um, Duke Frederick and Oliver, the moment they arrive, in the forest, they are changed. And of course, it's the end of the play and Shakespeare's got to sew up some things, but they are changed drastically in, in, in an instant we hear um, to perhaps their truest natures, which are good. Um, and Rosalind and Orlando, their love is kindled before they enter and they are swept up. They're just swept up in this full fever, like chest cracking love. It seems to really transform you before you even, before, before you even speak about the gender issues of being a, um, of pretending to be a boy, she. I think there's something about Arden itself, and I and I never really thought about that, in in a conscious way. This big picture idea of identity um, being exposed um, by your surroundings and your circumstances, and forced to ask the question of who am I? Um, how do I express myself? What do I want? It's like these the questions. Sort of reckoning with authenticity and i i, th I th feel like the the first time you hear about that um spoken very plainly is duke senior and the first time you're in a scene in arden he talks right to it and if i may speak just a few of these lines he he because i just 
feel like he puts his finger right on it at the beginning of scene, act two, scene one. Now my co-mates and brothers in exile hath not custom made this life more sweet than that of painted pomp. Are not these woods more free from peril than the envious court? Here feel we not the penalty of Adam, the season's difference, as the icy fang and churlish chiding of the winter's wind, which when it bites and blows upon my body, even till I shrink with cold, I smile and say, these are no flatterers. These are counselors that feelingly persuade me what I am. I feel like he, he just hits the nail on the head of transformation. But, um, uh, <clears throat> He's so aware of, aware of his sort of authentic position in the world where he can feel the wind on his arm as opposed to someone telling him, flattering him, telling him about what might be going on afterwards. I love that. Um, so moving, I should move on to gender identity because that really is a question. <laughs> I'm sorry for the diversion. Um, you know, perversely, it's what helps Rosalind and Violet explore these issues of authenticity are by dressing up and pretending to be a boy. And um, I think Shakespeare explores this issue by giving them each this big juicy present of assertiveness in the form of male prerogative. I mean this is partly because obviously like you said the roles were played by boys initially but it still make today still today makes them so attractive as roles for women to play because and also because of the inherent danger in them um for shakespeare i, I think love and danger seems to go hand in hand um hiding your gender in society is a risky pretty risky endeavor um even if it is sometimes enjoyably sexy because there's always this element of possible exposure and uh, we experience that tightrope walk that uh, Rosalind puts us on through Celia and with Celia in that second wooing scene. When Celia says she can't say the words when Orlando um, uh, Rosalind says, marry us. Celia says, come on, come on, you know. Um, and it's like a gift. The gen I think the gender change is a gift, um, as well as being a solution to surviving disaster you know ensuring safety and preserving virtue um it's also offered as a sort of restoration to their souls they both arrive um in these places arden and illyria in completely defeated by what has happened in the beginning of plays and in their disguises they sort of renew them and expand them again it's that sense of heart opening that arden does for Rosalind, it's just cracking open and becoming who, who you really can be. And that's what disguise does, for sure. Um, and it's like, I, I, when I think of those boy actors who played these roles and what that must have been like to then get to, get to be a boy. So, to spend, so you're pretending to be a girl, but then to suddenly get to be a boy for part of the play and how freeing that must have felt to return to themselves and sort of access all the things they needed to be. Um, power and ardor and, and um, the scope of what they needed to do. Um, yeah, so that's, that's it, yeah. Yeah, that feels like a very, very rich place to start. I mean, you mentioned yeah. a number of things, one, one of which is this very unusual dare I say, erotic structure in As You Like It, where Rosalind and Orlando have a series of wooing scenes in the forest, and they get progressively more intense until Rosalind at one point says, propose to me and marry me right now. And her friend Celia, who's been watching the whole time, is really freaked out by what's, what's about to go down. It's like, whoa, this is all a little bit too real. And the other thing you mentioned is the forest of Arden and also Illyria as this place of this landscape of transformation. It's interesting that the titles of the two plays, As You Like It, and the subtitle of Twelfth Night, What You Will, Twelfth Night or What You Will, are all about just make-believe, that these are not realistic places, but these are, these are landscapes where you can perform whatever role, whatever identity feels right to you. So we'll, we'll come back. Francesca, but I want to introduce Michael Yuri to this conversation. Hello, Michael. Hi. Hi. <clears throat> uh, 
Thanks. So, um, I, God, it's so fun listening to all of this amazing stuff and, and, and so exciting because I, 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 as I was thinking about it, I, I thought, oh, I hope nobody says what I want to say and, 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 the, and nobody has because you're so smart and, and so brilliant and, and I'm stupid. Um, but this is what I think. Um, <laughs> I, um, so, so, so I, I, I think that, the, the, uh, when I think of As You Like It and What You Will, like those two ideas, and I think about the Forest of Arden, especially the Forest of Arden, I think that these are the places where you can be the thing that you're told you can't, you're not supposed to be, and, um, and that they go to the Forest of Arden to escape you know, whatever persecution they, they've been getting in their, in their place, the same way that we escape the suburbs of Texas or whatever to go to um, New York or San Francisco. I always think of the Forest of Arden as San Francisco for some reason, but like we escape these places to go and like be who we want to be. And obviously like uh, Rosalind is, it, it becomes um, Ganymede to, to, uh, to not only escape uh, Rosalind, but to, but to have, to, 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 to be allowed to wander the, the, the forest without a male companion and, 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 uh, and find that. But Duke Sr. has escaped political persecution. And, and I think Jaquies, you know, they always refer to Jaquies as this melancholy, like this, this uh, they, 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 they call him uh, a sinner. I think that that's all code. And I think that, I think that, that Jaquies has a much more fluid sexuality uh, than, is, than, than, than people were used to. And, um, and, I, and I think that Shakespeare is winking at his, I mean, you know, like, right, he, okay, so this is a crowd pleaser. These, are, these, are, these two plays are some of his crowd pleasers. And they're all having, his audience is having the most amazing time watching what they know is a boy playing a girl, playing a boy. And, and these plays are, are such a wink to that, such a nod to that. Like, I know I've made you watch all these, like, these tragedies where, where a boy plays a girl, but you're supposed to fall in love. And, and so now let's just turn it all on its head. And he's created these almost, these characters that are almost um, pansexual in that Orlando is basically in love with Ganymede. He has basically fallen in love with a boy. He doesn't know it's a, actually a girl, but but he basically like he's ready to go there, and if and, and if Celia doesn't step in, he will go there, and um and I and and, and you know and, there, and there's so much of that in Twelfth Night too, where where you can feel Duke Orsino basically falling in love with Cesario, and 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 there's no there's no like there's no um, there's no homophobia. I mean, they didn't have that then because they didn't know what it was then but like they don't there's no like ew gross no no way we put that on now when we put when we do those plays we put it in but at the time that's not in there that none of that's in the text so so i think that there's this wonderful queerness to these plays and um and as i mentioned this festival i'm producing it's a queer festival and um and we have playwrights um, who are trans and non-binary and gender non-conforming and a lot of actors who are and directors who are too. And, and, and um, one of my wonderful young playwrights uh, who is non-binary, um, we started talking about uh, some of the characters in their play and, um, and, and about who should play them and whether a, a cis actor should play a non-binary character and a non-binary actor should play a cis character. It's very interesting and fascinating and, and, and a, in a lot of ways, really new territory. And, and I said, well, when you act, because this person also acts and writes, I said, what do you gravitate towards? And they said, Shakespeare, 100% Shakespeare. They said, the only, the only playwright that I really feel at home when I'm acting is Shakespeare. And I feel like there's this really, this Shakespeare was was really playing with this pansexuality and uh, this this fluidity uh, that that we have to kind of put a modern lens on, but at the time was uh, was was up, up for grabs. Not only was there this whole meta "I'm a boy playing a girl" thing going on, but I think that their sexuality was was. They hadn't, you know, they hadn't really like discovered homophobia yet. So they were, they were willing to play these games and, and, and enjoy that. Um, I mean, of course, like 
And the easy one is Antonio. Like, how can Antonio in Twelfth Night not be gay? And I, I've even heard, like, uh, of productions where, is it the elephant that then he says, meet me at the elephant? I've even heard that some productions put the elephant, uh, make the elephant a gay bar. I, I, I get that at the National Theater. Thanks. Oh, Simon's production, Twelfth Night. Nice. Brilliant. And, 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 and uh, uh, was that the production where they wake up in bed, where Antonio and Sebastian are, like, in bed, post-coital? before they're sent off? I should have done that. That would have been really good. <laughs> well, I heard about a production like that. I mean, and, 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 and that, so that it, right away, Sebastian is a bisexual man. He later falls in love with a woman, but he has this romance with, with a man. And, and I mean, it's really hard to, to it's really hard to not see uh, Antonio in that way. And I think for the same reasons, I think that uh, gay queens, uh, especially, I think that when they talk about his sin and his lechery and, and, and even his, uh, you know, uh, even his, when they call him a Philistine, I feel like it's all code. And what he escaped from the city to the, to the forest was really like, he was able to go and be himself. And, um, and, 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 and he loves the fool because the fool is, you know, he's obsessed with the fool because the fool is, is, is all, is, is completely, um, earnest all the time and and he wants that and he's and that's that's sort of where his like sadness comes or his melancholy comes I think is from not being able to really be that and I mean I mean you know and then and and then he, he's he becomes even more unabashed about it as, as the play goes on he's he flirts with Orlando he says pretty pretty youth uh, what does he say that great line when I pretty pretty youth let me be better acquainted with thee to Ganymede he loves these pretty boys he's He's obsessed with these pretty boys and this funny, this, this other funny guy. So um, it's very notable that he's very interested in Touchstone in Act Five. And they have a very long, witty exchange, kind of like, you know, feeling each other out a little bit. Like, well, what's your deal? You seem like yeah. an interesting guy. Yeah. Yeah. And, he's, and he doesn't care about Celia at all. He couldn't care less about Celia, this beautiful young woman he's not remotely interested in. And he's fascinated by people. So there's something, there's something there that, that, I, that I find very exciting. And, oh, and, I, and, and also, um, I, I, I read today, while I was doing all my work on this, um, that uh, uh, there's this theory that, that Shakespeare based Jaquies on Christopher Marlowe. Have you heard this? Who was like, probably gay. And I mean, I, I feel like Mercutio is often, is often offered up. Sorry, Michael Whitmore? No, and a spy. I, I, I right. There was plenty to work with with Marlowe. Yeah. <laughs> you also mentioned uh, this very crucial detail that very, becomes very clear when you stage Twelfth Night, which is that Orsino never sees Viola as a woman in the entire play. She is presented to him as Cesario, the page boy. And then at the end of the play, he says, I too will share in this most happy rack. I, I, I'm, I want in on all of this pansexual uh, intrigue that's happening. He, he totally takes her word for it that she's a woman. And similarly, Orlando, he falls in love with Ganymede. He doesn't fall in love with Rosalind. Uh, it brings to mind, you were, you were mentioning uh, the Elizabethan court and Shakespeare's conception of sexuality. I found this quote from Plato's Symposium. It's the fable of Aristophanes the origin of love, a single being divided into two bodies seeks reunion, and this is the source of love. The singleness of personality is broken down. In other words, this was, this was, this was the kind of stuff they were reading in Elizabeth's court. It didn't matter who or what you were, you had to get beyond your single personality into a bigger love that was bigger than you know, these, these names that we apply to them. Uh, you know, Simon. That, that song from, uh, uh, so, oh, sorry, that song from uh, Hedwig and the Angry Inch, The Origin of Love, is all about that, that Plato uh, theory about Zeus slicing uh, two, women, two women apart, two men apart, and, a, and uh, a man and a woman apart. And that's how, uh, that's how we have this sort of uh, fluid sexuality. I knew we would get to Hed Hedwig and the <laughs> <laughs> And of course, Ganymede, Ganymede is Zeus's cuff bearer who is yeah. beloved for their erotic beauty. Right. Uh, 
Simon, we've, we've, we've been missing you as part of this conversation. Well, well I, I, I'm, I'm enjoying it. I'm, I'm just so happy that the, uh, that the elephant made an appearance uh, in, in my production few. Uh, and um, yeah, what, what, what great points. I mean, before I embark on my on mine, are, are there any comments from the audience, Drew, that we should be referring to or questions that I should try and be grappling with? There are many questions from the audience. In fact, so many that I need time to go through them and maybe after the interval we can come back to them. Okay, well, fantastic, exciting. So I'm not gonna to say too much, but I'm gonna refer us back to a little bit of history. So I'm gonna have my notebook next to me, if that's okay, because I think you can shine light on this idea of theater as a transgressive, playful space in a way that a lot of us have referred to already. But before that, um, I did a bit of uh, Shakespeare research. And I, apparently there is um, an anonymous letter that was attached to the second quarto of Croydon and Cresta. So basically by a contemporary of Shakespeare's. And we don't know who it was, anonymous, but this is a small little note commenting on what a Shakespeare comedy is. So it's like the Shakespeare Hour, there. And uh, this is what they wrote. So much and much savoured salt of wit in his comedies, that they seem, for their height of pleasure, to be born in that sea that brought forth Venus. Venus, goddess of love and sex. Sex is the height of pleasure, and that's the kind of thrill we get from Shakespeare's comedies. They are clever, they are funny, they are sexy. And they take a view of the world as a sea, that our lives and our identities are not fixed, they're not static, they are playful, they are fluid, they are in movement. And then I thought it would be uh, useful just to contemplate for a second about theatre in Shakespeare's age. Now, when Shakespeare was growing up, of course, there weren't any theatres as we know them. Plays or touring work would happen in churchyards, in um, houses, in universities, in great halls, but it would not be in, in a particular place for that purpose. So when Shakespeare was 12, James Burbage created the very first building just to do plays in. And of course, he called it the theatre. That was a big deal. It was new. So Shakespeare grows up and they start to proliferate and you have the swan and you have the rose and you have the globe and Shakespeare himself grows up to be this other strange thing called an actor, which was a new job because before the, uh, I, let me get the date right, I, I guess sort of um, mid 16th century, people that did plays were amateurs. They were part-time people who would have other jobs as politicians or as clergymen or school teachers. So you have a space for theatre and you have a, a person whose job it is to basically tell you lies. And you can see why Shakespeare as this writer became immediately very fascinated. You have the drama, which is a lie, and you have the theatre, which is real. So he quickly starts to apply this freedom of thought to his characters and even to their gender. That everything can be playful, everything can be one thing and also another. Hence, you have ambiguity that's born in these theatres, in these plays, as it were, for the first time. Now, uh, yeah, and in a funny way, that's kind of where I, I, I wanted to just kind of state that, that, there's, that there is a historical precedent, there's not a whole context for that theatre as a permissive environment that I think a lot of our panel have been talking about. So back to you, Drew. And speaking of context, we have a bunch of questions about how these plays were staged in Shakespeare's time. So I want to go definitely to Michael Whitmore with those, but I also want to say we, we've been getting so many questions that we haven't had the space in previous weeks to answer them in the Shakespeare Hour. Uh, so for everyone who's asked a question, if we don't get to it tonight, I promise that I will respond to them personally. We have somebody cataloging them, keeping track of all of them, so you will hear from the Shakespeare Theater if your question is not answered in the short time span that we do have. Uh, and we also I want to quickly update everyone on how the Phoenix Fund is doing. Simon, do you have an update on the well, Phoenix Fund? I have a one. Well, look, okay, talking of the history of theaters, Shakespeare Theater Company is hanging on. Thank you, everybody. That's been part of that amazing project to keep theater alive in the nation's capital. The Phoenix Fund, the fund that is a help that has been created to help us get through this, has indeed just passed $1 million. Wow, that is entirely down to you, to all those people who have given, thank you so much. Our trustee that has agreed to match every dollar given to the Phoenix Fund has been so inspired that he got in touch with me this week to say he would like to continue matching to 2.5 million. So it's pretty awesome. So we are gonna keep 
fundraising. And if folks tuning in this evening would like to make a donation to the Phoenix Fund, that is incredible. Um, every dollar that you give will be matched by the trustee, so it will be worth double. And you can go on our website and, uh, and give any amount from $10, $50, $100, whatever you feel. We're so grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Wow, $2.5 million. It's, a, it's so, um, I can't even, I'm speechless. Uh, a question from Anne Harkins. In this fascinating discussion of identity, how do we honor, in today's world, playwright Larry Kramer and Dr. Fauci, who describes Kramer as a tough activist with a perhaps hidden heart of gold? Uh, Larry Kramer, for those of you who don't know, tragically passed away recently. I've got his book right here in my, my mega library, pre premiered at the New York Shakespeare Festival. Uh, and I think you just, you just did honor Larry Kramer and Harkin. So thank you for mentioning uh, an activist, crusader, playwright who is in all of our thoughts tonight. Um, regarding the, the context, the historical context in which these plays were performed, uh, I would be interested, Margaret Symington asks, in knowing if there was outside of the Shakespeare Playhouse where men played women, any recognition of intersexuality, transsexuality, or gender ambiguity in the time of these plays? Uh, Michael Whitmore, you're, you're nodding your head. Uh, yes, I, that's a really great question. Uh, we impose a lot of our beliefs, particularly beliefs in binary sexuality and what we call heteronormativity, the idea that male and a female are the only two erotic partners on a period that didn't see it that way. So starting with the science, there was a, a, a theory from Galen, the classical physiologist who said actually men and women are the same creature and depending on how much heat you have in your body you may transform from a woman into a man so so they actually look to science for that and the french writer michel de montaigne wrote an essay about a woman uh, who a woman who at age 22 uh, became a man and she lived out the rest of her life as a man so uh, there was plenty plenty of thought about the fact that there, there, these may be tendencies on a continuum. And I think Shakespeare understood that. Uh, the second thing is there was also pressure. So there was a sense that when men dressed up as women, that that, or women dressed up as men, but on the stage it's, it's men or boys dressing up as females, that that was dangerous. And so when we get the word travesty from transvestism, which is to wear clothes of another sex. And so the Puritans who used to jump up and down and object about the fact that there were these things called playhouses were particularly upset about cross-gender dressing. And their worry was that if, if we in the audience looked at characters transgressing these gender boundaries, we ourselves would be transgressing them. And, and that means they believed that there was this power for people to kind of become something that they're not just on the basis of the make-believe that Simon was talking about and that I think Michael was describing. Um, so there's real precedent in the period. It's funny, we haven't mentioned Malvolio cross-gartering in Twelfth Night, which may not be explicitly dragged, but certainly is received as a sort of shocking transgression by a religious Puritan to dress that way. The, the clothes really do make the man. Uh, a question for uh, Frankie from Katie Kruger. I'm getting so many questions so quickly. Uh, these female characters have so much more power in a romantic relationship uh, than they would ever have if they were themselves. In other words, by dressing as boys. Do you think these power shifts in romance work in the same way to a modern audience when women have so much more autonomy now? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid they do, yes. I think that they do. I think what I uh, was talking about, the gift that the, that the um, Shakespeare gives these two characters or the people playing these characters of assertiveness um, is huge. And I think that today, I mean, I, I know one of the things I love about playing this character is because she gets to do that. And she gets to be completely emboldened by this persona that she gets to put on and she gets to get right up literally up into orlando's face looking at his 
features and commenting on them and saying, you know, you can't be a lovesick person because you, you know you don't have a sunken cheek and you don't have your eyes and look at you. I mean, she's just fiercely emboldened in a way that makes me that I know that I feel connected to something much more um, grounded doing those playing that role than I do in life. I'm, I'm sure of it. And I think that, that we still search for those roles. We still search for those relationships to look at, to make us feel that we were, you know, we're definitely in a much better place than Elizabethan women were, but I think we still get very excited by these characters. It's, it is interesting how much power they have in the world yeah. of the play. And we were discussing Prince Hal last week uh, with Stephen Greenblatt and company about how he has the power to kind of be chameleonic and is always in control. And it does feel like in these plays, Shakespeare's giving that power to Viola and to Rosalind, that they are the Prosperos or the Hals of this world. And there's a tremendous power to be found in that. A uh, question from Michael Yuri from Mary Hardiman. Is there anything in modern comedy or performance, for example, Monty Python, that draws from these Shakespeare themes and fluidity? You were mentioning your contemporary play conference, as well as Hedvig and the Angry Inch. Does anything else come to mind? That's interesting. Well, you know, Monty, what's so interesting about Monty Python is, you know, like they would put on a dress, but th that wasn't the funny part. They would always, you know, they would, it wasn't just funny because they were wearing a dress, you know, or like the kids in the hall, you know, like they, they put on a dress, but then it's still funny uh, uh, on top of that. Um, so I, I, I never really thought of those, those kinds of groups uh, um, as being uh, any kind of commentary on sexuality, um, because it's really so much about, there's so, so they're always so situational or, or, uh, wit wit based um comedy uh but but it, it, it yeah it, comedy today you know like that, 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 that you know like the tricky thing about queer stuff in comedy is that it's it, it, it's so easy to make a gay joke um and like we've seen it's, it's so many for so many years movies where uh like it's it's that's the joke um and and now that like people are becoming you know more hip to um, sexuality and certainly um, more hip to uh, the fluidity of of sexuality and and as as the the rainbow of of the queer community has gotten so much more diverse, um, we're having to be a lot cleverer about our comedy than just you know you know adding 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 a gay joke um, and. Uh, I think I think it'll be interesting. One of the um, one of the plays that we're doing uh, in Pride Plays is called Masculinity Max, and it's 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 about a trans man who gets re re reacclimated to his family after transitioning, and um, and 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 sort of learns from the these butch guys in his family how to be butch and realizes this isn't what I want either. And it's very funny, um, but it's very post you know it's almost post queer. Um, in, it, in its comedy. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting conversation because also, you know, like Hedwig is hilarious. Um, I can't believe how much we're talking about Hedwig. Um, Hedwig is hilarious. Uh, uh, but so much of that, so much of that story is about how Hedwig overcame something. And now that we're in a place where like, uh, where, where, where like stories are being told post acceptance, not about the overcoming, not about the uh, this sort of coming, not about coming out as much anymore and more about uh, what's next with people who accept me. Um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a different landscape. So, so it, it'll be interesting to see now that we're sort of in this like, this like how things become more, you know, and, and as we see more productions of Shakespeare that, that embrace queer and, and, and uh, gender nonconformity and, um, it, it will be uh, it'll be really interesting to see how we find the funny in that, and and I think it'll I think we'll look to Shakespeare because Shakespeare was without homophobia and was without um, any of that. Well, we have many more questions, and Michael Whitmore is saying I should do office hours, which I think we're probably going to do some version of office hours for all these leftover questions. But I want to hear some Shakespeare, and uh, before 
we were we started broadcasting tonight. Frankie, you had cast Michael Yuri in the role of Orlando in a, a scene that you wanted to read. So I feel like we're, we have an impromptu play that we're putting on on the Shakespeare Hour tonight. Do you want to preface the scene a little bit by no, telling? Well, I, I thought of this one as a as a way of showing that sort of knife edge that she puts herself on, and by extension Celia, and certainly the audience, where she really pushes the envelope. Um, uh, uh, in, in, in the disguise and, and the, the, the terror of, of, of being seen for who she really is. But she's pushing it all the time. So this scene is the end of the second scene. Uh, the first, sorry, the first scene they have together. And uh, she decides to give him lessons, love lessons. Um, and uh, so it's, Michael, do you have, it's line 378. I hope that's the right line. Love is merely a madness. Act three, scene two, yeah. Line three, se three two, love is merely a madness. Three, seven, eight. Yes, I've got it. Yeah. Love is merely a madness. Yeah. Um, just through to like woo me, which is like, it, it, this is basically, um, you'll see when I read it, yeah, how, what I mean about her on this knife edge, okay. Um, so she says, love is merely a madness, and I tell you deserves as well a dark house and a whip as madmen do, and the reason why they are not so punished and cured is that the lunacy is so ordinary that the whippers are in love too. Yet, I profess curing it by counsel. Did you ever cure any so? Yes, one, and in this manner. He was to imagine me his love, his mistress. And I set him every day to woo me. Uh, at which point would I, being but a moonish youth, grieve, be effeminate, changeable, longing and liking, proud, fantastical, apish, shallow, inconstant, full of tears, full of smiles, for every passion something, and for no passion truly anything, as boys and women are, for the most part, cattle of this color, would now like him, now loathe him, then entertain him, then forswear him, now weep for him, then spit at him, that I drave my suitor from his mad humour of love to a living humour of madness, which was to forswear the full stream of the world and to live in a nook, merely monastic. Thus I cured him. And this way will I take upon me to wash your liver as clean as a sound sheep's heart, that there shall not be one spot of love in it. I would not be cured, youth. I would cure you if you would but call me Rosalind and come every day to my coat and woo me. Now, by the faith of my love, I will. Tell me where it is. Go with me to it and I'll show it to you. And by the way, you shall see where in the forest. We shall tell, you shall tell me where in the forest you, you live. Will you go? With all my heart, good youth. Nay, but you must call me Rosalind. Come, sister, will you go? <laughs> Great. Well done, guys. That's fantastic. She's so, like, pushing it all the time. She can't help herself. She just, it's great. It's exciting. Um, Drew, do we have time? To, I'm just thinking of time. Maybe we should sweep, sweep to Michael Whitmore and then to Michael Ure's text if we've got time. It's so great to hear this, to hear this, act, this text in action. Yes, should we go to Michael Ure next? Are you, are you ready? Michael Whitmore, and then we'll, then we'll let Michael them Whitmore, Michael Whitmore next, and give Michael Yuri a break. Exactly. Oh, it's, it's so great. Uh, it reminds me when I used to teach at Carnegie Mellon, which had a fantastic drama school, there I'd be teaching a Shakespeare class. I'd say, would anyone like to read a speech? And then these incredibly beautiful, charismatic, talented people would stand up and read, and the class would be over. <laughs> but I, I think it's so wonderful how these characters are game for this courtship. The fact that, the fact that this, this game is gonna have to take place through effort and guile and deception and make-believe. The play is really passionate about the, the possibilities of those powers. And right, it's the thing that constantly shocks me about the theater is we go to these places and tell these incredibly talented people to lie to us and 
because they're telling us something that we know is kind of untrue, we believe it all the more. And, and we want that. And so the way that these characters are able to just kind of beckon, beckon in and say, let's play this game, it's just amazing. Do you, Michael Whitmore, do you have a piece of text from one of these two plays that you want to share? Well, I, I, I don't, except for memory, which is the final scene, the reunion scene in Twelfth Night, which is when um, Viola is looking at, Seba at Sebastian and one of the greatest very long sentences in Shakespeare where she says effectively dot, 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 if circumstances would jump that I am Viola. And it's at the end of a very, very long speech and she won't say who she is. She's just waiting. And the line as it falls together essentially means some point in the future, we're gonna tell this story and all the circumstances like two pieces in a furniture or a chair, they line up. That's what the word jump meant. That when they jump, you'll realize that I am Viola, but not now, it'll happen later. And this is one of just the eros of delay in Shakespeare is amazing. And I think that is probably the greatest speech about delay and recognition that he wrote. Um, and it floats along on a, on a sentence. It's just amazing. It's like a master class on how to do things with words. Wow. You know, the, yeah, the, the tense of the speech is conditional, just like the entire action of yeah. the play. It's the subjunctive, which is the super powerful mode in English, and it's the same one where Ariel says, when the people are being tortured, Prospero says, should I pity them? What, how do you feel about that, where they're suffering? And Ariel says, well, my, my heart would break were I human. You know, you have to imagine someone else. And there's this thing about our language and our brains that says, we're happy to entertain conditions or people or stories that we know are not true. You know, Ariel's not human. And for that reason, Ariel's sympathy is so much greater. Um, I think Shakespeare just loved to crank down on the English language and use those beautiful tenses, especially when they're given to actors who can deliver it. And in fact, Patrick Page, when he appeared on the Shakespeare Hour, identified precisely that section of The Tempest to read. Oh. So great minds. Uh, Michael Yuri, we, we come to you. So I've been uh, thinking a lot about Jaquees, as I said before, and about um, what what is um, kind of uh, uh, code or what words are uh, sort of substitutions for what I think he is. And when people call him certain things, they, they talk about him a lot. And 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 and, um, and there's a great there's a there's a great speech where where he describes himself. Uh, that I think is uh, is very telling about uh, the things that we say about ourselves and the things that we don't say about ourselves. So uh, it's it's right after he's, he he comes in with um, Rosalind and says, "I pretty 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 I, I pretty pretty youth. Let me be better acquainted with thee." And um, she she says he's melancholy, uh, and, and and he says, "Why why it is good to be sad and say nothing." And she says, "Why then it's good to be a poet." And he says. I have neither the scholar's melancholy, which is emulation, nor the musician's, which is fantastical, nor the courtier's, which is proud, nor the soldier's, which is ambitious, nor the lawyer's, which is politic, uh, nor the ladies, which is nice, uh, nor the lovers, which is all these, but it is a melancholy of mine own, compounded of many simples, extracted from many objects, and indeed, sundry contemplation of my travels in which my often rumination wraps me in a most humorous sadness. You can really hear how loaded all of those adjectives are and how coded they are. Right. I yeah. love this reading of Jaquees. It, it's totally opening my eyes in a, in a new way to the character. Cool. <laughs> um, some more questions while we have time. Uh, from Marjorie Cooper, did contemporary playwrights like Middleton, Thomas Kidd, et cetera, have the same sexual ambiguity and transgression in their plays as Shakespeare? And another question from Eleanor Spoor, 
did Shakespeare write erotically of Marlowe? Wow. I do not know the answers to that second question. I, I, I don't know of any reference to Marlowe in Shakespeare that is erotic. But maybe Michael, Michael, Michael Whitmore might, might, might touch on his contemporaries. That's an interesting question. Yeah, I, so I think the whole institution of theater, so playwrights are switching around, they're collaborating. Shakespeare worked with Middleton. Uh, we now know that Marlowe wrote sections of, the, of 2 Henry VI. So talking about fluidity, these were artists who, like today, they're, they're working together. And I do think there was a common stock of plots and characters. And there were boys dressing as women in all of the plays. So everyone was kind of in that ambiguous space. But, you know, for, the, for my money, I think Shakespeare was more alive to the possibilities of the ways in which gender ambiguity could really uncork desire or make a plot go sideways or, or, or wherever it's going to go. So I, I think there's a reason why we really have thought a lot about sexuality when we think about Shakespeare's comedies and why um, so many artists have turned to Shakespeare as someone who could help them push out of these boundaries. I mean, just, just to add to that, when I was just doing some work on the birth of theatre, right, I got the statistic that between 1590 and 1642, when, of course, the Puritans closed the theatres down, boo, there were 2,000 new plays. Yeah. You know, many of them are lost to us now. But this was such a boom. And yet, as a director, I sometimes go back to those kid, Middleton plays, uh, kid plays, Decker plays, thinking, oh, there must be some other real gems here and i tell you they're jolly hard work and whenever i go back <laughs> i think shakespeare was really good like he was pretty much one of the original writers from the theater and he kind of nailed it forever straight away so i'm with you eleanor spore glosses her previous question was not shall i compare thee to a summer's day a reference to marlowe Ah, oh, Michael, you wants to come in with this, I think. Well, I mean, I, 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 they say a lot of those sonnets were written about a man uh, or a boy, or, and, um, and uh, that is very interesting. I mean, I, I know that there's no, like, proof that Shakespeare and Marlowe actually, like, met or knew each other, but there's so many, sim there's so many lines that are, that, that are in Marlowe plays and in and Shakespeare plays um, that I... I it, it seems it seems like they, they very well might have known each other, and and there's a lot more about Marlowe being queer, and certainly like Edward II is super queer, and um, I don't know, that's interesting. I I had never heard specifically shall I compare thee to a summer's day is about Marlowe, but I've heard a there lot. is a line in As You Like It where I believe Touchstone is talking about a great reckoning in a little room, and it is a joke about outhouses, uh, so you can imagine what kind of reckoning was happening, but. Some scholars believe that is a reference, a coded one, to Marlowe's murder being stabbed through the eye in an inn. So it's kind of, and, and as you like, it was written, I believe, right around, right in the, right in the immediate aftermath of Marlowe's death. And he was stabbed at, the, at the, the reckoning when he got the bill for a meal, he was stabbed through the eye because he was a spy. But it could be both. You know, I, the facts are one thing, but in the end, these are plays. And, it's very hard to say it's only one thing. Uh, another thought I would just like to share before, we, I know we're, we're gonna close up soon, but just in terms of uh, Shakespeare as writer that was contemporary, Shakespeare that was a dangerous writer, and Shakespeare that we have a new understanding of right now, was that I was certainly drawn to those lines in Twelfth Night when um, Olivia first sees Viola dressed as Cesario and feels desire for this boy, as she thinks, and she says to the audience, even so quickly, May one catch the plague. Methinks I feel this youth's particulars. Sorry, methinks I feel this youth's perfections with an invisible and subtle stealth to creep in at mine eyes. Well, let it be. But to be in a theatre, to be in a space where the plague was a big deal, mm -hmm. step forward and make a joke about how like how similar the plague that will kill you is to falling in love is a supremely brave act. It's like somebody writing a play right now and making a really brazen comparison with COVID. And it's just a very striking 
thing to return to these plays. With each age we pass through, we see new resonances in Shakespeare of our own and realize he was somehow ahead of us. He reads us rather than us reading him. And I do think that if we've learned anything tonight from this extra, extremely rich, fascinating conversation, I know I've learned a bunch of new things. One is that Shakespeare's plays are never one thing, that they are subjunctive in their meanings. They are conditional, they set fire to our imaginations, they celebrate pansexuality, they celebrate the multiplicity of experience. So Olivia's line is incredibly erotic as well as dangerous at the same time. So I wanna thank all of our guests for joining us on this week's Shakespeare Hour. Uh, next week, our theme is democracy and empire. And we are talking about Julius Caesar and Antony and Cleopatra. And we will be joined by the author of The Year of Lear, James Shapiro from Columbia University, along with other wonderful guests we'll be announcing soon. So stay tuned. See you all next week. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Drew. Thank you to our amazing guests, to Michael, to Frankie, and to Michael. And of course, to you, Drew, and to our listeners. Thanks, everyone, so much. Thank you. Well done, everyone.